financial crisis. Next, please. So a kind of uh, constant theme for the for this region is uh, the demand is very strong, as you can see from the sales, but uh, the supply is not really catching up. So what I'm showing you is the number of homes for sale on the on the MLS listings, and you can see if anything there is kind of a slight decrease in in recent years. But if you compare that with this uh, strong increase in demand. That translates to the month, uh, the, uh, the inventory is measured by month of sales is significantly down. So uh, in the most recent data, what we have is uh, the current inventory can only sustain about two months of sales. Okay, so, so the market becomes really tight. Uh, next, please. So the, this thing shows you uh, the median number of days on the market for houses listed on uh, the MLS. So if you look at uh, right after the financial crisis um, in 2010, 2011, it was 70, 80 days. Uh, this is median, not average. Average is gonna be longer. But if you look at the most recent data, it's less than 10 days. So if you list your house, you can expect to get it on a contract with less than 10 days. So the market has been really, really tight in the region. I, my guess is it's gonna be similar in, in even in green. Uh, uh, in Greensboro. Uh, next, please. So this, of course, will translates to uh, an increase in uh, in prices. So here I'm showing you uh, the both the median and the mean price uh, over the years. So one of the things is the median price has been increasing at about seven to uh, five to six percent per year rate uh, in the region. And that if you consider the income growth rate, that was about 4%. Mm -hmm. So the house prices has been, uh, growth rate has been significantly higher than the income growth rate. Uh, next, please. So now let me show you some kind of comparison because I do not want to talk about Charlotte all the time. So here I have both Charlotte and, and, and uh, Greensboro here. So the first figure I'm showing you, this is the metro area. So the Charlotte metro area and the Greensboro metro area and other regional cities. So here I'm only showing the regional cities, Asheville, Charleston, uh, Columbia, Raleigh, and uh, other places. So uh, let's focus on Greensboro. So the Greensboro, the average price is not that high. Okay, the, the median price. So it's, uh, it's a little over $150,000 uh, in the metro area, which in Charlotte area, this is already like two, uh, 30, um, uh, to $30,000, the median price. And the other thing we look at is the, uh, uh, the growth rate from 2018 to 2019. So all these numbers are 2019 numbers and then also the growth rates are from 2019, 2018 to 2019. And one thing got uh, the Charlotte region really worried is really the growth rates. The growth rates uh, uh, in median house price in Charlotte is 8.5% Charlotte MSA, but uh, in Greensboro, it looks okay. It's 4.14%. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's among the lowest in, in, in the region. Next, please. And uh, the other thing we look at uh, is the, is the uh, uh, median house price to median income ratio. Often we use... Any question? Okay. So usually we use this as one of the metrics to look at uh, the affordability issues. So I'm uh, also uh, marking the, uh, the ratio of three and four because usually if uh, the ratio, the median uh, house, house price to median income ratio is below three, it's considered pretty affordable. If it's uh, uh, above three, then you are entering into a territory where affordability becomes kind of issue. If it's above four, then it's severely unaffordable. So, and Charlotte currently is 3.5 and it's growing very fast. Uh, Greensboro is still under three, but it's there and uh, it's growing. So, uh, um, so it will be entering uh, the area where affordability can become a kind of concern um, in the near future. Next, please. Uh, I think I'm, 
so this is uh, this is rent. Um, so uh, median rent in 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 uh, in these uh, these cities, and uh, again Greensboro, the rent rent levels are not that that high. It's a little over eight hundred dollars uh, per month, um, and uh, but uh, the growth rate is actually pretty significant. Uh, it's uh, at two point four nine percent. And uh, of course, it's lower than like Asheville and uh, uh, Spartanburg, but it's kind of higher than a lot of other cities. So that might be kind of a, a slight concern for uh, for uh, the Greensboro. Um, that's all I have uh, for uh, for uh, this. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Oh. I actually have one more slide, which is price to rent ratio. Sorry. Uh, so uh, this is kind of sometimes considered kind of a sign of bubble if you, if the price to rent ratio is really very high. Um, so again, uh, Greensboro is kind of in the middle of uh, in the region. Of course, uh, one of the things I want to talk a little bit about is if you compare other 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 cities, for example, Asheville and. Uh, uh, Charleston, there are kind of very different cities because uh, those, a lot of those are kind of retirement, tourism related. Um, um, but uh, with that, the, the price to rent ratio is, uh, is kind of in the reasonable area, the region in, for Greensboro 15, and it's not growing at very high, high rates, just, but Charlotte is, Charlotte, the, that ratio is growing at 6.7% ratio. So uh, overall, I don't see that Greensboro is facing a significant challenge uh, in terms of house price, uh, both uh, at the level of house price and the growth rate of uh, house price. Uh, thanks, that's really what I have. Thank you so much. Um, why don't we go ahead and open up four questions? I, I think we're gonna have plenty of time this session since we only have three main speakers. Um, were there any questions for Dr. Chu regarding um, these comparisons between Charlotte and Greensboro uh, and the overall market trends? And feel free to unmute yourself and, and ask away. So Stephen, hi. Hi, Sophia. Hi, what I wanted to jump in and say was I'm happy to see that the affordability in Greensboro is good. Um, and I'm sure as the other speakers will make note of, but of course the inventory is not, not good. Um, and um, because my organization works with the city of Greensboro and does the down payment assistance intake, the applications are really coming in, but the competition to get the homes is fierce. It's not uncommon for people to say, They've made multiple offers on multiple homes. It's taking them several months to find a home, but I am happy that we have programs like we have here in Greensboro that make it more affordable in terms of down payment assistance. Definitely, that that um, down payment assistance program is, has been um, magic in some communities. Mm -hmm. um, being able to uh, afford a starter home um, uh, where starter home prices have, have gone from 80 to about 120 very quickly, um, you know that that ten thousand dollars of assistance um, plus can can really um, make the difference in being able to buy those homes. Um, so uh, Sophia's question, I guess, is is more around um, housing affordability and housing stock. Um, Dr. Chu, did you have any comments on that? Yeah, so I, I can only uh, talk about what we see in the data from uh, the Charlotte region. So uh, you're absolutely right that the inventory is very low. So it's uh, less than two months of months of supply. Uh, and uh, also affordability is a big concern. So I talked about the median house price was increasing at like five, 6% rate, right? but uh, the lower end of the market, if we look at the 10th percentile of the price, it has been increasing at uh, about 15% per year rate. And uh, in our study, we consider $150,000 house, house in the region as a starter uh, home and uh, the percent of houses sold under 150 has gone from um, 40 percent in 2014 to 8 uh, percent in uh, 2020. So that really raises the very significant affordability concerns um, in, in this region. I think it's probably similar trend in, uh, in Greensboro as well. 
Yeah, if we just cut those numbers in half, I think we have Greensboro, um, the, the prices at least. <laughs> Any other questions for Dr. Chu? We're gonna move now to Scott Schubert and let me pull up his bio real quick. Scott is the originating branch manager at Benchmark Mortgage in Greensboro. Scott got into the mortgage business in 2003 and has been a mortgage loan originator for over 15 years. In 2009, he and his wife Tammy opened Greensboro's branch of Benchmark Mortgage, a direct to Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, and Jenny Mae Lender. Benchmark Mortgage is also currently servicing over $4 billion in loans. And I'll pull up his presentation here. And share screen. Scott, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks everyone for being here. Um, I'm gonna try to make this as informal as process. So, you know, my slides are more bullet points just to kind of spark the conversation. Um, if you can flip to the next one for me. Um, so some of what we're dealing with today, we really have to go back to, again, the beginning of this year to understand where we've been to know where we are right now. So, you know, 2020 was supposed to be a wonderful year for so many different people in so many different industries. The economy was humming along. And then, you know, uh, I, I think everyone can probably guess when COVID hit the markets, um, looking at this chart here. And if you look at the extreme volatility, the chart that we're looking at here, this is the mortgage-backed securities market. So the very brief economic lesson here behind the scenes, mortgages get bought and sold just like stocks. So, you know, when you call up a lender and say, hey, what's today's rate? The reality is, is that's a, such a moving target. And oftentimes when you hear, you know, the numbers are released nationally or even locally, those really aren't the real numbers because that's probably last week's data, the week before data, things like that. And so there's always going to be some are a little higher, some are a little lower. But regardless, just like if you were trying to buy a stock on behind the scenes, mortgages get bought and sold. And on this particular chart, green is good for rates and red is bad. And so what happened is, as you can see, in leading up to this very volatile stage, you see a lot of green. And that meant that rates were getting a lot cheaper. And that was just sheer, you know, COVID was starting to hit, but people didn't really understand what the ramifications were. It really didn't hit the fan just yet. And so we were doing a lot of refinances people and we we're just heading into the purchase market because this was around February leading into March. And so in March rates were at some of the, the cheapest they've ever been, even since before the last, um, housing crisis back when rates got really low in 2008, 2009 timeframe and that timeframe between like 2008 to 2013. And COVID created so much uncertainty that it really broke the mortgage market. Rates went from driving low under three and a half to say around three and a quarter to overnight going to four and a half and costing multiple discount points. So we had clients that were um, pre-qualified expecting to get a rate around three and a half. And at that moment, you can see the extreme volatility in there. We simply, I mean, we didn't have any viable rates to offer anybody because the market said, we don't know what's going to happen in 10 minutes, let alone tomorrow. When we were sitting there trying to price loans out, literally I'd have someone on the phone and I'd see a $2,000 jump in the cost of each individual rate as I was talking to them. So, you know, like all clients, we want to understand and maybe sometimes we want to negotiate a little bit and the conversation literally went like, okay, sorry, that rate's no longer available. It costs $2,000 more now. Do you want that one or the next one? Or do you want to wait another five minutes and see what happens? So it was very like, honestly, that time period in my 15 plus year, that those were the most stressful two weeks of my life is as it relates to business. Um, then what wound up happening, um, the government stepped in, they started buying mortgage-backed securities to kind of even out the market. And then you can see where it went straight up again um, on the tail end of the, um, of, of the where uh, Stephen has made the, the yellow highlights. 
And then they kind of did too much. And then you see a pullback of the red right underneath it. And so then rates got super low again, and then they went straight back up. And then you can see over this time frame since then, um, the government has, the Federal Reserve has kind of changed its monetary policy over the last several years when they, 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 they play with things quite a bit. And so you can see where they're really, um, they're maintaining the market and they're interjecting cash where it needs to be. And then there's times when they're pulling back. Um, this morning, for example, they, or yesterday rather, the, and the Fed meeting, they pretty much came out and like their report said, didn't, didn't share too much extra information as far as what their plans are moving forward. So at this stage of the game, we still expect them to be buying up mortgage-backed securities and other treasuries and things like that, keeping rates low, moving in that direction. So that you can see where we've been to where we are now, as far as from a market perspective, but you know, back then and all that uncertainty, just like in many other people's positions, you can see, you know, just how crazy that this has been in that time frame. Um, you can move to the next slide, Stephen. So in today's lending market, really what we're seeing is because of that uncertainty, everything that we just looked at and all of that, basically what happened was prior to COVID, like for an FHA loan, for example, we could go down to a 580 credit score, which you know, isn't great. Um, usually when someone is in that 580 to 620 range, somewhere in there, um, you're, it's probably no, more than likely it's because someone had some old bad stuff. Hopefully that's been corrected. It's had a little bit of time to rehab. So that's when lenders were really looking at, um, you know, okay, we can now give this person a loan. Maybe they have to put a little bit more money down. Maybe the rate's a little higher, but they can get a loan. Well, in that line, that line went from 580 to 680 overnight to the point where we could not do any loans under that mark. About a week into that, we dropped right back down to 640, which is for many, many years, that was the line in the sand. Now, I'm not talking about subprime loans and things like that, where some people might do, you know, give for, for lower credit scores, but um, there's not too many of those lenders out there anymore. So, <clears throat> typically what we'd see in the mortgage industry when there's big events like this, we see underwriting kind of ebb and flow um, as a pendulum would swing. When things are going great, everything gets looser, right? We don't need quite as much documentation. We're um, uh, easier on people. The, the restrictions are less. And then when something catastrophic happens in the economy, everything gets tight because despite what some people think, lenders really don't want your house. What lenders want is their money back, right? You, you're, they're giving you money to buy a home and they just want to be paid. And so they don't want an art, they don't want to own real estate. They don't want to do any of that stuff. And all the decisions that lenders make are all about risk models. And they're all about whether they think that they're going to get paid back or not. So what we saw was in, in that particular moment, not only did the credit score requirement get much worse, but the pricing got a lot worse to, to cook in what the, um, the risk that we were taking. So for example, and a lot of other lenders did this as well, but those lower credit score, like for FHA, for example, under 680, nobody else was buying that loan. Like we were like, I, like in my bio, it said that we're a direct to Fannie Mae Freddie Mac and Ginny Mae lender. Well, we also have several other relationships with different servicing lenders that we would, you know, just like any lender, they're typically selling off their loans, not the, you know, the back end goes to either the, any of those three entities, but somebody is servicing the loan. So whether it's us or say, you know, Chase Manhattan, Citibank, or Penny Mac, somebody like that, that that's pretty typical stuff. But no, all those people stopped buying those loans. So that meant that if we were going to do an FHA loan under 680, we had to service it. And then basically we had to own whether that loan was going to be paid back or not. And so when that happens and there's nobody else in town and you're the only person that's willing to do something, the pricing gets worse. So even today, we're still seeing this, that where we can do loans between 620, 640, up to 680, but 
even under 700, the pricing is a lot worse than what it could have been, what it was prior to COVID hitting. So the tighter guidelines, in some cases, we're still able to use kind of some of the relaxed guidelines on certain programs where it's not hit as much. And then in other ones, it's like we've gone back to, you know, back, you know, 30 years ago when you had to basically, you know, give it. Get a, give a blood test in your small child just to get a home. Um, so we're having to ask for more documents in a lot of cases. And we're having to, because of the volatility, like if you're using a bank statement or an investment account and it's the most recent quarterly statement that's two months old, they're not going to, they're going to, they're not going to take that because they don't know, did it get better? Did it get worse? I mean, you look at some of the things and we'll get in this when we get to the next slide that there's, um, there's um, the, where the economy has come today, a lot of it's because of where the economy was in the second quarter. Um, when I say pricing has also gone old school, that means they really are looking at every single little aspect. What's your credit score? What's the loan size? What's your debt to income? You know, two people with identical situations, if somebody has, if someone has very little debt and the next person has a car loan and three student loans that um, you know the other person doesn't have. Those two exact situations prior to this would be a case where the pricing would probably be the same. But now the person with more debt, a higher debt to income ratio, their, their, their rates are gonna be worse. So that of course would affect affordability where you have to have more money and things of that nature. And so that's where it comes into the risk versus reward. You know, at least, you know, again, with our company, we, you know, we want to give people loans. Underwriters aren't trying to deny loans out there. They want people to be able to buy homes. It's, you know, it's how the whole market moves. It's how all that happens. But there's risk involved. And so whenever there's risk involved, they're going to ask questions. They're going to require documentation because it's never what we believe. It's what we can prove. Um, you can go to the next slide. So what this shows is this is kind of a snapshot of Guilford County. Um, and there's lots of different little nuggets in here. I'm not gonna go through every one, but you can see from in the top middle section, um, you can see where the medium home price is 217,769. You can see the historical and forecasted appreciation of homes um, on average over the last 60 years, it was 2.9%. Over the last 10 years, 2.2%. And over the last five years, 4.5%. Um, what you're seeing in here, and again, and this kind of alludes back to some of Dr. Chu's graphs, you know, Greensboro, in, where, you know, in Guilford County, we haven't, we, our appreciation seems to lag behind some of the bigger cities like Charlotte and Raleigh. And that's just kind of a function of Really, it's a function of jobs and it's a function of how the velocity of money moves within there. Projected forward, you can see over the next year, we would expect 4.23. And then the, the five-year forecast is a cumulative 20.6. So that's not 20.6 every year. That's 20.06 over the next five years. So with that said, you would expect it to be fairly, fairly similar to what we've been seeing. Um, if you go down, you know, a key thing, um, there's 226,000 renters of which 57,000 can afford to buy a home. So, you know, when we start looking at those types of numbers, that's a big chunk of chain, big chunk, chunk of people that will probably want to buy homes at some point, because most people, you know, it's called, it's, it's called the American dream for a reason, you know, home ownership, land ownership, you know, that's from the, from the beginning of time, um, you know, land is very important and, and people owning land is very um, desired. If you look at the chart next to it with the blue squares and the check marks, um, you can see with the homes that are being built, and this is kind of goes across the country, but you know, we're, we're not immune to it, you know, and some of the, um, the stat statistics that Dr. Chu was mentioning, you know, why homes are staying on you know, why they're not staying on the market is because they're, you know, they're, there's so much competition, they're being bought up very quick. And so you can see what the gap, how many people want to buy homes compared to how many are available. 
and you see the check marks are the ones that are there and the, the ones without check marks are the extra ones that we need. And so there's such a gap between the desire compared, I mean, it's, you know, so when it comes to this kind of stuff, it, I mean, this is simple economics, it's supply and demand. When the demand is much greater than the supply, what happens? Prices go up. So, and that's what we've been seeing. Now, at some point, it's not going to happen forever. Hi. It's going to keep coming in and they're going to keep rising. And then at some point, it's going to stop. And that's kind of what happened last time. It was, you know, back in the 2008 housing crash, there were other factors that contributed that. But the biggest thing that related to that moment was people could no longer refinance the mortgages they had to try to alleviate some of the burdens they were seeing because the home values dropped so much. So we had job issues, but we also had value issues at that point. And so over eventually that can happen um, over time, you know, real estate, you know, rises in value. That's what it's always done, but it doesn't mean that there aren't snippets where you've seen it pull back. Um, in the bottom middle, you can see where the unemployment rate says the national average is 7.9%. This morning, they released the, the new information for this month and it actually dropped to 6.9%. So again, the main thing that affects rates as a general rule is inflation. Are we going to have inflation or not? And when we have jobs numbers that are good, when we have things of that nature, that usually will mean that there will be future inflation. And that's what makes rates go up. We're in this weird cycle with, you know, the election going on. There's a lot of uncertainty still, and not only in what's going on in the presidential race, but in a lot of local races is who's going to control the Senate. All that stuff comes into what, how we think that this is going to go on and what will wind up happening with rates moving forward. So, intermittently, we expect to see a lot of volatility. Um, and so much so that the day after the election, the, the like that chart that we were just looking at, the mortgage-backed securities market did very, very well, even though the stock market was doing well. But none of that translated to pricing of mortgages because everyone hedged in the what-if factor of what was going to happen next. So down from your local lenders to Fannie Mae to everyone in between, it, it was it was shocking because normally we'd see a jump like that. It would be great. Tomorrow rates are going to be better, and you know anybody we've been talking to, it would be in a much better position. So um, you can see in the bottom right corner, that is the affordability index. Again, that kind of um, talks to some of what you know Dr. Chu had mentioned. You can see where that is ramping up from 2019 into 2020. So. The thing about unemployment and the affordability index is, you know, it, we talk about the national numbers, we talk about what the trends are, but it's also very localized to that individual person, right? If you're a one person household and you lose your job, your unemployment is 100%. So you, these things you have to understand and the, all these things that we look at are, are, are simply surveys like the this unemployment number that there's 60, they make 60,000 phone calls and they come up with this average of that. So clearly sometimes these numbers are gonna be skewed a little bit. So every, every month when we get the new numbers, they also make revisions to the prior months. But the affordability index, what you can see there is it's getting better. Why? Because wage, wages are going up. Even though the homes are getting higher, people can afford them. And a lot of that has to do with a lot of that has to do with where the interest rates are. The simple fact that interest rates are so low at all time lows means that you can buy a larger home for the same cost that a smaller home would have, say, a year ago. And so when you look at it from that perspective and it's going on the trends of what it's going, basically, if if they rise the same amounts like they have, which is roughly 5.7%, if houses increase over time, 20 to 25%, the home affordability will still actually increase based on those numbers. So the, the value of homes and as long as rates stay low, now that, all that changes when, all that changes if rates go up. So if rates say go up a point after well, this is all said and done, then everything we're talking about here are going to, the numbers are going to be skewed and the affordability will go down based on that. But that's, those are, that's really what we're all seeing. Um, from a jobs perspective, 
you know, we're getting good numbers now, but the reality too, is again, this is where it turns local. We're still down 9 million jobs pre pandemic. So obviously there's certain industries that are hit. There's been winners and losers in, you know, the, the, the jobs market, as far as what's going on, you know, what's been going on with the pandemic. Some of that is natural and some of that was, has been government related, right? The government deciding who opens and who doesn't creates certain environments where somebody who wanted to work couldn't. And there's other aspects where just the nature of, you know, we're doing takeout food, we're doing, uh, you know, telecommuting, we're working from home, though all of those types of things have all gone gangbusters. People aren't, you know, they can't do anything. So they're fixing their house up, all those types of things, you know, in real estate with the rates where they are and the, the continued selling of homes really drives the economy in that way between the people that do the loans, the people that sell the homes, the people that fix up the homes, the companies that support them, all of those things come into play and really drive the economy. And it's why the government is, and that's not just local, that's across the country. It's why the government is pays so close attention to how the real estate market does. And, you know, I'm not going to go off, you know, I'm not going to talk about bank bailouts and things of that nature, but there's a reason why the government watches that stuff and makes sure that this piece of the economy continues to grow and move in a positive direction. Because if it didn't, there, there would be large ramifications on a grand scale, much more so than what our economy could have handled, which is what happened the last crash that we had. Um, so that, you know, I pulled that quote from Jim Cramer that he said during the summer, that, and that's why, you know, the lower rates have had this biggest, the multiplier effect because of all the different people that it, it takes care of, um, as far as, as the economy grows, um, as with that, um, I mean, the other aspect that has occurred with this and where we think that home values will continue to rise, the cost to build a home right now with the scarcity of supply chains, lumber itself on, if you're talking about, you know, a larger home, <clears throat> a larger home, just the lumber alone costs 30 to 40,000 more today than it did pre-pandemic. So builders are now in the very beginning, they probably, a lot of them, the one builder that I had spoke to, they didn't really pass those costs along but new builds now, you for darn sure they're going to start passing those along. You can't run a business and continue to absorb, you know, all of your profit margin in just supply costs. So we're going to start seeing homes grow into that, you know, to some of Dr. Chu's points as well. Your first time home buyers, it's, you know, those, those, those prices are going up. You know, what you used to be able to get for those lower prices have increased quite a bit. But um, that kind of stuff, I'm going to, kind of, I'm going to let uh, Melissa talk through. Um, with that and for if there's questions now or I don't know if you want to go through Melissa's stuff and then do yep. joint questions or however you want to do it. Let's go ahead and do some questions. We we had a quick one here about the affordable affordability index. Is it mm -hmm. read um, as more unaffordable as that number goes up or less unaffordable as that number goes up? More affordable. More affordable. So above 100 then is more affordable. Correct. So when you look at it, so if you look back in 2018, as that was going down, interest rates were rising and a large proponent of why the home affordability rate was, why that was dropping. And then you see, as we go from 2018 into 19 and then into 20, it starts to increase and it's pretty low, but then all of a sudden you can see the beginning of this year, it shot straight up. And that's when rates really started taking off, driving lower. Gotcha. Okay, so lower lower interest rates mean more affordable housing. Correct. Gotcha. Um, so not as much a, a factor of the median home price, but more a factor of the financing um, costs. Yes, but I would say, you know, I mean, I don't have a chart in front of me, but it will drive the median prices higher in a lot of cases because when rates are low, you can move your move up price is cheaper. So you might say you live in a say you live in a hundred and fifty thousand dollar house, and you know your that was your first home that you bought. Maybe it was less than that. And if you're gonna buy, if you thought you were gonna buy a hundred eighty thousand dollar house, well, with the where prices have been, 
you might say, well, I don't want to, I don't want a 180 to 190 house. Rates are so low. I can afford a 250 house. So you have that driving the prices up when people can go up. It, it alleviates that first time home buyer glut as well, because it allow it opens up that home for someone else to buy. Right. So unless you have someone that's downsizing, they're at the tail end of their home owning career you, you know, predominantly that those lower sales prices are going to be first time home buyers. I mean, sometimes it's going to be, um, you know, sometimes it's going to be people that are downsizing, but most times that's what it's going to be. And so when you have a case where the income, income isn't as good, um, people have, they're not confident about their jobs. And that's, again, this is, this is one of those situations where this really is going to be a have and have not situation. If you have a job, there is a good chance that your income has been rising. And I mean, within, I'm not saying just the fact that you're working, but you, you know, for years, nobody was getting raises, you know, or they got a very small raise. It was like, Hey, I, I got 1% this year, whoopee, but that's better than losing your job or the fact that you got a raise at all. Well, now we're seeing raises really, if you look at some of the labor statistics, most increases are on a year over year basis are really, like 3% just with rising with inflation, that's not really a raise anyway, but that's low. Most people are getting four to 5%. I mean, sometimes even more depending on, you know, where things are at. But, um, but again, if you, you know, if you're not working, you know, you have that segment of the, of the population where they're, they, they, they can't, they don't have income if there's not new jobs in there, because again, some jobs are being created, but what we're seeing, just from a practical perspective, there's a lot of folks that they don't want the jobs that are out there. Maybe they had a maybe they had a slightly higher up job and they lost that because of because of the the pandemic. But you know they don't want to go work at you know the Harris Teeter Distribution Center is hiring. You know you can walk you know when they do their little fairs, if you got all your stuff in order, you can walk in, do your drug test do all the paperwork, do the background check, they'll hire you that day. But that's, that's one type of job. And someone that had been working in an office for the last 10 years probably isn't going there for, for work. So you've got this, you know, you, let's say you've got the have and the have not situation there where somebody, you know, maybe they're not working. And then with the stimulus not coming in again, being renewed, You've got folks that are, we're seriously going to have start having an issue as far as um, future foreclosures and future evictions. And a lot of things were done to prevent that for a while, but they can't do that forever because then all that does is push the burden on the landlords and the people that, you know, own the house and the mortgage servicers and all that comes into play. A lot of that has dropped over time, but there's still going to be that smaller segment of people that they're, they're, you know, you can't get blood out of a turnip. And if they don't have the money to pay it, eventually, eventually they're going to, the, the, the remedies that exist aren't going to be enough and those people are going to lose their homes. And so that's, you know, in the future, I'll, I'll defer to Melissa on that opinion more, but I, I believe that that's probably the part that we'll start seeing some homes where we start seeing the appreciation at least slow down. It might not stall it and may cause it to come down, but it might it might pause the um, the, the appreciation levels that we expect to see. I think we have one more question in the chat from Yamil about credit scores. Yamil, do you want to ask that? Sure. Um, I don't know if I missed it, but I wanted to know when you said that the credit scores were fluctuating from 580 all the way to 680 within days. Um, how and who determines the credit score minimums? So there are certain, depending on the loan program, sometimes it's kind of a hard, it's a hard stop. Like um, generally speaking, a conventional loan per their guideline, you have to have at least a 620. Some of the government programs, they themselves don't have a minimum, but most lenders do. They won't, because again, it's all um, it's all risk based um, with that. So most lenders are saying, and even like when we would do loans down to 580, 
that was a choice. I mean, FHA, you can go down to 500. But the reality is, is that hardly anyone's really doing loans that low. Even the ones that say they go that low probably aren't really doing a whole lot of them. And if they are, the risk factors that, you know, let's face it, if you've got a low credit score, there's a lot of stuff on your credit. I mean, you have that you have a lot of things on your credit that will prevent you from getting a loan credit score, you know, forget the credit score itself. But if you've got a bunch of charge offs and you've got, you know, a bunch of late payments and you've got this, there's a good chance that all of those things combined will make it so that you don't fit guidelines. But specifically, who determines the credit score that they will accept? Sometimes it's, um, you know, like, you know, Sophia mentioned the Greensboro program, you know, like they have, they don't have a credit score, but North Carolina housing does. And so whether if I could get someone alone at a 620 score, North Carolina housing will not do their loan, but Greensboro would. So, but again, the pricing is going to be horrible because of the risk. And so the practical side of, in some cases, the pricing that comes up, I cannot legally charge people what I would be getting charged in order to do the loan. So what, you know, when we have lower credit scores, I mean, we've seen it to where you're trying to do an FHA loan. Can you, can you explain that last sentence, that last statement? Yeah, so when the risk-based models come into play, the lower the credit score, the more cost you have. So if you have a 740 score, I would say, you know, today's, today's loan rate, you're going to be at anywhere, let's just call it between 2.875 and three and a quarter, just depending on where you want those points. If you have a 640 score, I can do an FHA loan, but a rate in the mid threes is going to cost multiple discount points, probably two or three, to the point where I can't charge that much legally, because it's not just what I charge; it's what the attorneys charge, it's what the the you know my home office fees are, it's the cost of the interest rate, it's all these other things that come into play. When you add it all up it pushes it over the legal limit for what the federal government says we can and cannot charge. So now you're in a position where how do we get this person a loan? And so some of that times it means we have to, you know, we have to get creative. We have to get the seller to pay some closing costs. So that pushes it onto them, but we're in a market where that's really hard to do. So it all kind of comes into play um, as far as that goes with, um, with that. But, you know, but strictly from the credit perspective, most lenders are creating the risk tolerance they're willing to accept on these different programs. Thank you. Yep. That was a great question and um, great insight into how that credit score impacts fees and cost of the loan. Uh, we just uh, dropped a quick poll. Uh, out of 46 attendees, 17% have refinanced in the last six months. 7% have a refinance in process. Um, so a lot of people taking advantage of those lower um, interest rates and refinancing their house. I just uh, saved $400 a month on mine. Um, closed last week. I think Melissa f found me coming out of John's office uh, as I uh, wrapped up the paperwork on that. There you go. Yep. Um, we're going to move now to uh, Melissa Greer. I'm going to end the poll here and give me just half a second. And Melissa, you, you didn't have a PowerPoint, correct? You're on mute still. No, PowerPoints have never been my strong suit. <laughs> Sorry, no, Stephen. No I can worries. talk a lot if that's okay. That that's quite all right. I'm, I think I'm, my presentation's better just verbally. I'm sure. So Melissa Greer is a licensed realtor and broker, active in Greensboro, North Carolina since 1984. Um, she has a GRI, a Graduate Realtor Institute, um, and a CRS, Certified Residential Specialist designation, which places her among 4% of agent, na agents nationally, nationally who hold these credentials. Uh, in addition to placing within the top 10 in the nation for closed transactions in 17, 18, and 19, uh, she also is a recipient of the Chair Chairman Circle Diamond Award, uh, top one half percent of Berkshire Hathaway Home Services nationally uh, for five years running. Um, 
and I'm going to turn it right over to you, Melissa, to talk and all about that. And I can't do a PowerPoint presentation. That's really <laughs> embarrassing. No, you, you can sell one. homes. Well, let me tell you something. These are two tough acts to follow. So please bear with me. I'm going to um, just tell you a little bit from a realtor's perspective on a real estate market that in 36 years I've never seen. And um, I've had to relearn everything pretty much because I think we've been in unprecedented times. A lot of it Scott's touched on as far as our, um, but if you wanna look at it in just a, a really interesting way, how it even affects first time buyers and people in a price point under, let's say 250. Right now in all of Guilford County, if we pull all our active listings, we have 678. 678. Now, through my career, that's been as high as 4,000. I mean, we've had thousands of houses on the market, especially during the recession. If you look at the houses that are under 250, we have 249 houses on the market under 250. Now, that, that includes townhomes, condos, and everything, but that's just in Guilford County, but that is hardly any inventory. And, uh, you know, I think that's been very consistent for the past, definitely this year, it's so interesting when we had our shelter in place and COVID really started amping up, no one really knew what it would do. And the thing that it did is made it almost a desperate housing market. Um, people wanted to make sure that they were in a place they felt comfortable. They wanted to make sure that where they were, I mean, Scott spoke to it as well, that you could refinance and make your place someplace you liked. So that's why the contractors are so busy. So it's really been pretty amazing. Um, the, the hardest thing, and, and I mean, I'll touch on it and it breaks my heart, and I think Scott would agree with me, is it is so difficult for first-time home buyers right now because anything in that price point, they're so low inventory, it is very competitive. And if there are any investors that are out there and they're going to get these houses because the terms, a first-time home buyer cannot compete a lot, and, and a lot of times, um, just to give an example, a few townhomes I've listed in the past couple of months have been in the 130 to 150 range. One of them we had 16 offers on, 16. Now that, I mean, I never thought in my entire career I would see that. So when you're looking at that and we get into what we call a highest and best offer, people are outbidding each other. They're going high. They're saying, we don't care if it appraises. They're putting unbelievable amounts of deposits down that are non-refundable. So when you see that, the way it applies to first-time home buyers, usually they get, and Sophie can probably speak to this a little bit, but usually they get minimum down. They don't have a huge down payment. Um, they go with the programs, like Scott talked about FHA, where you really put three and a half percent down, you try and finance your closing costs. And that's how first-time home buyers have always bought houses. They negotiate seller paid closing. That's almost unheard of now because in, in that price point, you have people who are buying that have either investors or parents helping or, and to compete, it ends up being something that is really difficult. So that does, that breaks my heart right now. I started doing this. I wish Stephen, I forgot to take out the year I started doing it because that you could do it as a child when I started. I just want everyone to know that, but I've done this for so long. And when I started, I was 22 years old and all I worked with were people who were starting out and my heart is there. And it's, it, it's an interesting time for first time home buyers. The only benefit to that, I think is as Scott's mentioned, and, and you know, we all know it in Guilford County, things are selling for top dollar. They're selling as high as they could possibly sell the appraise. And especially when you have people saying they don't care if it appraises, the sales are higher than a lot of times the appraised value, which increases now but if we do see any kind of correction in this market, usually we'll see that those values may jump down a little bit and that if you paid top dollar, you may, you may have to keep your house for a while to, to make sure. So I know during the recession, we saw a lot of people bring money to closing who couldn't stay long enough and they had bought in the bubble that was 2004, three, five, six, I can't remember now, but it's right around there. But anyway, in the recession, I went to a lot of closings and it was it was heartbreaking to see people actually, sellers bring money to closing. So all those perspectives, not I, I'm an optimist and I'll tell you, this is a great market for realtors, for lenders. 
it's a great market for the people that can get in these homes or that can refinance and, and really do something that helps them financially. But, but it's just amazing. I mean, and, and I, right now I don't see it changing, thankfully for, for, uh, I mean, I, and, and I mean, Scott can speak to that as well. And I, I would hope you ask questions for him that you haven't asked because obviously I was an English major. So the numbers will, I can only fake that so much <laughs> and then I'll have to defer to someone else. But I mean, it's an amazing market. I mean, now, as far as anything above 250, if you, if you're between 250 and five, it's still a pretty crazy market. It really is. You don't see 19 offers or that sort of thing, but you'll see a lot of multiple offers. Once we hit four to five and above, it's a, it's just a normal real estate market. And in Guilford, the only other thing that I'd like to touch on as far as housing in this county is that, and, and Dr. Chu, you'll, you'll see it's Charlotte is way different, I think. And I think what we see is we don't have a huge market for luxury properties here. So Greensboro is like a well-kept secret. I think that we... I think that we have you get a lot of house for your money in the higher price points. So that is one benefit is as tough as the starter home market is. If you're buying anywhere above eight to a million, and Scott, you can correct me, I think you get way we're seeing people commute from Raleigh and Charlotte now to buy those homes here because they can get such an incredible home for, for a lot less. So that's one unique thing I think to Guilford County that even Winston has a higher market for luxury market than we do. So, but I mean, I think overall, I'm, as long as, as we stay in this little bubble, it's going to stay this way. And we'll probably see a gradual correction maybe in the next year or two. But from everything I'm hearing, it won't affect the real estate market that much, even if the economy sees a correction. I think that a lot of people, that, and of course, that could change any time, but I feel like if anyone has any questions, I'm glad to answer them. Or if I didn't touch on something you're specifically interested in or you want to know, the investor market has been really, really good for us. And it wasn't for a long time. And I think that's because the rental market is so limited as well. So there's a lot of people. We need more investors because there's a limited rental market. And I don't think that's going to change. But I'm open to any questions. And corrections if I said something Scott that I like. Scott Scott's a good friend of mine and he keeps me on track. So. Stephen I wanted to jump in and say two things about the first time home buyer market. Definitely. So the the good thing is that um with us doing the, the down payment assistance and um and the numbers that are coming to get assistance about 30 to 40 percent of them are paying less for their mortgage than they're paying in in rent which is great from a housing counseling standpoint because it allows us to have that discussion about, about um, emergency planning and emergency funds for when life happens because we know life happens to everybody. So that's the encouraging thing. What's a little bit discouraging that I've been really trying to, um, to talk about with, with my, my realtor friends, I've been a realtor for 27 years, um, is that it's very important to not look at down payment assistance as something bad when you're working with sellers and that it's a longer process. I understand it's highest and best offer, but there's nothing wrong with the down payment assistance process where a seller should view that as a bad thing. Because you know, we don't want to get into classism and saying, oh, because you need this down payment assistance money, your offer's not going to get accepted. So I want to really promote the, the Greensboro um, Housing Connect GSO down payment assistance program. It's a really good program. And we have a process. And, and, and if the lenders get trained to know the process, it works simultaneously with the lending process, not after you get done with your underwriting and then you come to to get down payment assistance. It really should happen simultaneously. And I can't encourage that enough among lenders and realtors to not view that program as something that should be a bad thing. I'm gonna give it a shout out if I can, if I may. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I've never had a down payment assistant loan that did not close in my career. And it has always been the most beneficial, beneficial feeling. And, and the buyers are very educated as to what they're doing and what to expect before they ever get into the process. So now I have a listing right now that has a down payment loan that we accepted on a property in a neighborhood where we had several offers. So I, I will say that if you, those buyers are just as qualified, I think, I think the, um, you know, I think that program is going to become more and more important, truthfully, 
and I and I think it's a it's a great program. The only issue with there, and and this is something I'd love to brainstorm with you about, Sophie, is the due diligence deposits and earnest money deposits in a multiple offer situation become one of the most in, important things. It's just as important as the pricing, and so sometimes we need to. It's hard for them to compete in that way, not necessarily price or loan, but just putting down enough to where they feel comfortable and have it. And that, that's that been the only thing, but no, I've never had one that didn't close. And I'm a big fan of your program, really. And, and, and the people that can take advantage of it, absolutely, it benefits them and they love it. So. so I appreciate you saying that because since we do the classes as well, if you're seeing better educated buyers, it's because they're taking the class first. Oh, absolutely. absolutely. Because we, we walk them through the whole process and we do talk about due diligence and earnest money. And mm -hmm. even though you, you might be getting the up to $10,000, you still have to have $1,500 to $2,000 in this process. Just because the guidelines say a minimum of 500, you absolutely cannot get your offer accepted thinking, oh, I'm, I'll only put in 500. Mm -hmm. It is very competitive and we make them aware of that. And since we have class tomorrow, I'm going to reiterate what we just talked about about tell, make sure tell that you them, have somebody. tell them no matter what anyone says make their due diligence fee higher if it's a multiple offer situation than the earnest money tell them that's more important than the mm -hmm. earnest money that's a big big thing with the realtors and with sellers because that's non-refundable but it shows how earnest they are so thank you sure and not and to, to touch on that a little bit more as well you know and sophia i think you would agree like when when like when we do your program we, you know, Matt in my office, we, we, we have a really good handle on what you guys need and what you don't. And we're getting you stuff, you know, we're trying to manage it. You want everything, but we're trying to manage that through that process. You know, I think the biggest thing, you know, to your point is, is that education of on the surface, there is nothing, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the down payment assistance programs. And there's nothing, you know, it's the difference between is this person getting a loan? Are they doing FHA? Are they doing conventional? Or are they paying cash? And you, I have never met a listing agent that as long as the numbers are close, that aren't going to say, well, that cash offer is going to be done pretty quick and the, and the money's pretty certain. So the thing to overcome with this is what is the certainty that we are going to close? That is what I think a seller really wants to know. And the more weird stuff that we have to put into it, meaning, are we using down payment assistance? Are we doing a loan product that will create headaches for the seller if it doesn't close? Things like that. All those things are the real to the seller, but a lot of it is actually perception. And so where that perception part comes in is do, do does the list agent understand the, the, the hows and whys of it? Do they understand the pros and cons of it? And how have they presented the material to their sellers? So what, what we usually see in that, you know, like, cause in general, we're telling people, we're telling our clients, you know, don't ask for closing costs if you can pay them yourself. Because a listing, if, if 10 people are making an offer on a house, what's the chances that somebody is going to, make an offer asking for closing costs and three other people are going to offer five grand more than list price and not ask for closing costs. They're going to make more money. So you're trying to get the, you're trying to get your offer accepted as a, as a home buyer. But a lot of that is going to come into play. Like you said, how are you going to make your offer distinguished from anyone else's? And so those are the things, I mean, you know, Melissa gives good insight. How are you going to get yours more? One thing is that extra due diligence money because they know even if something happens and they can't buy it, they just got more money and there's a better chance that they're going to get their offer accepted based on that. I think you need to have a class for the realtors. <laughs> I'm serious. Yes. I do because I think the realtors need to be educated on it a little bit better to know that it's not a negative and that, and that to know that you actually train these buyers and they go to class. I don't know. I would, I would actually love to come to one myself. So. Idea. Well, we do make them available to realtors and lenders, so we can talk about that some more going forward okay. in the upcoming year. All right. Yamil has the next question, and then we have one, two from the chat. Thanks, Steve. I was um, wondering, what's the current average cost for closing costs? I'll, I'll throw that to Scott. 
But she, do you, that's a lender question. So just what's the, what's the average closing costs on a home? So usually what we're finding is your base closing costs just to get the job done, usually between 3,500 and 4,000 roughly. Um, now we're not talking about if you're doing like single premium mortgage insurance instead of monthly MI or buying the rate down or anything like that. So usually you're going to see the base cost just to get the job done. Lender fees, appraisal, attorney, title work, recording. Usually you're looking at about 3,500. Your taxes and insurance, obviously that's going to depend on the price of the home. So figure anywhere from 1,200 to maybe 2,000. And then your inspections on the house. So you now some of this stuff you might prepay. So it doesn't mean it's all coming to closing, but usually, I mean, it's kind of crazy, but when you add up between 500 and 900 dollars, six, seven, eight, nine times, all of a sudden you're at six grand. And it's very easy to get there. Now, how do, how do you pay for that? One of three people pay your closing costs. You pay in cash, the seller pays through negotiation. Mr. Seller, and this is kind of what we've all been talking about. In other markets, this has been easier to get. I'm going to give you 250,000 for this house, but I want you to pay five grand of my closing costs. That's an offer of 245. So you could say, I'll give you 245 and no costs, or 250 and 5,000 a cost, and that's the exact same thing to the seller. But the likelihood, again, in today's market, that you're going to get that offer accepted in a multi-offer situation. We can talk about how it's the same all day long, but the reality is, is that's what we've been seeing is that sellers are accepting offers that have the least amount of extra stuff going on in it. And so the only other way that you could get your cost paid for is if say the going interest rate was 3% and you took a rate of three and a half percent. Now in some markets, in some situations, it's easier to do this and not it depends on how the market ebbs and flows, but maybe if you took a, a quarter point higher rate, a half point higher rate, we as the lender give you a credit towards closing costs. Maybe it's $2,000. So if we're in a situation where you've got your down payment, you can't negotiate seller pay closing costs, and you only have a few extra grand, you might have to go that route. You pay more, you finance them. You can't just add them on top of your loan typically, but you can add them into your interest rate to get it from that perspective. So one quick follow-up, sorry, Steve. One quick follow-up. So in one of your slides, you said that you that we have over 200,000 people um, that are renters and out of that, almost 57,000 that are eligible. How does that affect those first time buyers that you had in that, in that slide? That tells me that that's a lot of competition that's just kind of pent up and waiting, right? It's that first time home buyer market is huge. And I'll bet you, I don't know this, my suspicions are is that 57,000 do not count all the people that just got out of college and are living in their mom's basement. Sorry, along those lines, um, I was just gonna show current on Redfin. Um, eliminating uh, open lots and setting it to studio plus so that we, we get rid of anything that's not really a, a house or, or an apartment. Um, this range down here at the bottom, 50,000, um, that bottom used to be about 40 or 35,000 in Greensboro. Um, the same, you know, vacant uh, dilapidated building that would have been 35 uh, eight months ago is now 60. Um, and when we look at starter homes that were in the 80s a few, a few months ago, they're now in the 95 to 100. So especially there in that, in that um, bottom of the market, um, starter home kind of uh, availability, there's very little um, still, still available, um, very, very little stock. Is that putting a squeeze as well on those 57,000 renters that could be homeowners? Just the availability or lack of availability? Yeah, I, I mean, I would definitely think so. 
we had a question say too because when you look at those houses that you just pulled up you know it's, it's like so when we go through an approval process it's not just it's you've got the buyer part right is their credit good enough do they you know do they have the down payment do their debts in line do they have the money in the bank so that's that person right so if we go through a pre-qualification and we do it and we say all right Stephen, you you qualify for you know you know, and maybe it is, say it was only you qualify for a $60,000 house. That's all, you know, you got a big car payment. It is what it is. You, this is what you can afford. The chances are in all of those homes that you just showed, the condition are probably unmortgageable. So it's not just the buyer. Now we have to get the property approved, right? Is it, is it a condo? Are there extra things we got to do for that? Is it a home that, you know, has holes in the sheetrock and the, you know, the siding is all messed up. And again, that kind of gets back to some of the stuff we were talking about before, you know, which loan are you doing? Who's going to, you know, who's going to accept your offer? FHA loans, for example, are harder on appraisals and the home condition than a conventional loan. But the misnomer is doing a conventional loan does not mean that you can buy a house that is a hunk of crap and isn't going to pass, you know, we're, we're still required. The appraiser is still required to tell us as the lender of any safety concerns. And so when you start looking at a home that it um, needs a little bit of work, I'll try not to call our housing market anything with uh, that are hunks of crap, but when it, when it needs renovations and it needs those things, it just simply doesn't fit the box. Right, because as a, from a lender's perspective, they're not just worried about you. What they're really worried about is if you can't pay and we have to foreclose, can we resell it? And most homes that go into foreclosure turn into homes that are rough around the edges. And so they don't want to give a loan on a property that started with a home that's rough around the edges. And I don't mean like minor cosmetic things. I mean, you know, major things that are problematic. Um, so a lot of those homes too, and that's where you see, you know, like kind of what Melissa was saying, you know, a lot of investors are going to buy those homes because they can pay cash for them and they're going to have enough money to flip them around and renovate them. So whether they're buying, flipping them to sell or buying and flipping them to start renting, you know, that those are two different things, but both come into play there. That's who I think you typically see buy those particular homes as a general rule. So I think this one's from Melissa um, from the, the chat. Um, uh, differences between the urban Guilford County and uh, rural G Guilford County markets. Um, are you seeing any differences outside of the city? No, I mean, we're really not. Guilford County overall is, is, very, is very desirable. The, the difference is that the closer you get to downtown, the more you're gonna pay per square foot. That's what, so normally the, the, what we might call urban neighborhoods that are close to downtown, UNCG, those it's more per square foot. When you get out a little ways in suburban or even urban or even out in rural areas, it's gonna, you'll get a little bit more house for your money, but they're still selling. They're all still selling really well. Andrew Young, did you have a question? Um, I think uh, your 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 amazing guests have uh, spelled out a pretty um, nuts and bolts way for for even someone with uh, with little understanding like me to, to to really get the bigger picture. But I um, maybe I'd switch my question based upon um, what others have been saying and the kind of answers we're getting. It, the way Dr. Chu and the rest seem to be describing Greensboro is that um, it would be, it's great for the upper end, um, maybe over 250K or into the $500,000 range. And it's great for outside investors. Um, and of course, I know uh, the uh, Center for Housing and Community Studies were you know, especially interested in, in the housing stock, housing stock for and availability for those uh, 57,000 that uh, that that uh, Yamil was referring to that's been on one of the charts. But am I getting that right from the guests that right now, uh, knowing that this is a very volatile time, 
that right now Greensboro is a great investors um, um, uh, uh, place and uh, it's great for those who've got the money, but um, there aren't any immediate solutions uh, to, to the, the everybody else, which I count myself uh, among the everybody else. But uh, I'll, I'd, I'd like to hear from the guests, please. I, mean, I, I can address that a little bit. I think, I think that if you're looking at it from a buyer's market versus a seller's market, it's definitely a seller's market in the lower price point. And that makes it challenging for any consumer, I think. The investors, they're usually not in these higher price points. So the only, the only benefit for them, I think, is that they may have cash, whereas uh, someone who was an owner occupant would need to get a, get financing. So it's hard for them to compete in their market. So, so I think, I think what you're saying is true. I think as we get higher up in price, it's, it's a tough market for either real. I mean, if they're buyers, it's easier, but I do think right now it's, it's a look, would you agree with that, Scott? It's probably. Yeah. Because I mean, what I'm seeing is, I mean, I had one, I have a client, you know, we just closed, but they, you know, they were looking at say 200,000. I I'm pretty sure that I wrote 15 pre-approval letters for them because that's how many times it took theirs to stick. Um, the investor people are, you know, I'm seeing investors come in from out of state. Um, this has been happening for a while and I've seen it increase. Like if you live in New York or you live in California, the, the rental market there, I mean, cost a million dollars. But here, if they are deploying capital in Greensboro, North Carolina, they can buy probably five homes with their funds and get five different loans between 60 and 100,000. Then they can use deploying all of their cash in the state where they live. So you know, there, I've, so what I've seen is that investors, because here's the other thing, uh, you know, and again, I don't have a specific statistic to back this up. It's just kind of what I see and just kind of what I feel in my gut. But, you know, investors really want, you know, they want deals. Where an investor makes money on the house, it's not on the renovation, it's on the buy. And so what they really want is they want to buy that $80,000 house for 40000 put ten grand in it and make their money. But in this market on those, you've got homes that, you know, some of them may not be in a great condition, but they're still selling. And so they're selling top dollar. They're not going to make as much money. So in some cases, you're, I, I've seen where investors have kind of paused a little bit. But where I am seeing that go is those investors are typically buying condos. That's what we've been doing, you know, just for me personally, we've been doing more investor loans on people coming in and buying condominiums. Um, than we are on single family homes. And, uh, you know, I mean, to, to, to a Andrew's question, the, I think it's not necessarily the, the first time home buyer that is having the issue. It's really, it's, it's this price point. I mean, anytime you have different combinations, you know, different levels of competition, um, do, do the investors have the advantage? In some cases, absolutely 100%. But the reality is, is no matter what your situation is, is how are you going to differentiate your offer? Because if a home, first time home buyer is willing to give more money for the home, an investor is not. In that given situation, just because the investor, maybe they're putting more down payment or, you know, but they, they want a deal. So they're given 20 grand less. That first time home buyer to a seller that thinks their house should be selling way up here, they're probably, as long as they feel comfortable that the, that person is going to get their loan and get that taken care of, they're probably going to take that offer. So, you know, it kind of comes and goes, but it's all about making yours look the best. Crystal Dixon, did you want to follow up with um, uh, private money, private lenders, hard, hard capital? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. This has been a phenomenal presentation. Um, and thanks for your comments, Andrew, one of my good friends here. Um, my question is, when it comes to um, investors buying those vacant properties you talked about, Stephen, and things of that nature, if they were to buy it cash, 
who funds the, uh, the the renovations? Is that where you're, you come in, Scott? Do you fund renovations at minimum or do they have to get a private lender to do the entire project? Um, so, I mean, we do renovation lending. It is a very specific animal um, where it's all tied in. Like, so for this type of thing, I would, like what you're referencing is probably more those type investors are probably buying in cash and probably renovating in cash. Private lenders, there's really, I mean, I'm not saying that they're not out there because they're, they're there, but they're, it's not prevalent like it was say in say 2004, five and six before the mortgage world crashed. So, you know, I, I mean, yes, I mean, that's a possibility, but I would say as a general rule, that's, that's not what we're typically seeing. Most people are retaining, because anytime you're, you know, with that type of financing, when you're doing that, there's a lot of strings attached to it. And most investors don't want to be bothered with that. They want, they got their guys, they want to do it however they see fit. They don't want in inspectors coming and checking their stuff. And I'm not talking about getting around Guilford County inspections. I'm just talking about if you're doing a, if you're doing a, you know, Fannie Mae's rehab loan, we got people coming and saying, well, you didn't, you're only 25% down, not 30% like you're supposed to. So we're not going to do your next draw and you know, all that kind of stuff. So you, that's not usually what we're seeing. The, the investor loans that we're, or the rent, rehab loans that we're doing as a general rule, we're seeing those are homeowners that are buying a house that, you know, in a nice neighborhood, it needs some TLC. They want to redo the kitchen and the bathrooms and a little this, little that. That's usually where we're seeing those kind of loans. Thank you, so helpful. Mayor Vaughn, did you wanna chime in on um, down payment assistance and gentrification? Oh, I can't shut it off. Good afternoon. Um, I just wanted to make a comment about the, um, the investors and you know, there can be a downside of too much investors coming into a neighborhood and that is gentrifying the neighborhood and pricing the people out who live there. So the down, the down payment assistance program that the city did was to really keep people in their neighborhoods and, and to avoid gentrification. And I think that's an important thing that is being maybe missed a little bit in this discussion that we don't want our existing neighborhoods to get overly gentrified and that we don't want people who live there to get priced out of their own neighborhoods. And that can happen if we have investors coming in, um, buying all of these homes up, they start renting for more, and then people can no longer afford to live there. So that was one of the things that the downtown, the down payment assistance program was supposed to help. Um, we know that when there is a dilapidated house on the market, that it's hard to buy it and renovate it if you're a first time home buyer. Um, but that, that's really I want, all I wanted to add is about the thoughts of the gentrification. Thank you. I'd like and, to add one thing to Mayor Vaughn's comments. With, um, when I was out there in Greensboro, one of the other things I experienced, and I'm experiencing here in Fayetteville as well, that when we have outside investors, especially those that are from out of state, they have a tendency to become slumlords. So uh, just to give context, Jim Eel was a uh, human relations director, city of Greensboro, and is now uh, with the city of Fayetteville in a human relations uh, role as well. Um, neighborhood planning will be doing a presentation next month uh, for our housing hangout. And so we'll get to talk a little bit about the, the 10 year affordable housing plan, receivership, and some of the new components there to, to address gentrification, target neighborhood redevelopment, um, uh, loan mechanisms and preservation funds um, that, that uh, will be employed uh, for some of these areas. Do we have other questions? Aspen, can, can I call on you since you're on as well? Aspen's at self-help credit union and and I know that self-help has some mechanisms as well for uh, different uh, um, uh, mortgage uh, programs. Sure, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I don't work in the lending side of self-help as much as the real estate side, but we do have a couple of different programs um, for first time home buyers and for we actually have a program that focuses on, on single mothers, for example. We have a couple that are kind of 
grant funded or foundation supported programs that really help certain populations. Um, so if that's of interest, I can definitely share more information about those kinds of programs. Definitely. Um, if, if you can send any of that to me, I can put it up on, on the website. We will have the website live uh, maybe about an hour after this. Um, I'll have the video recording and presentations from Dr. Chu, uh, Mr. Schubert, and um, uh, everybody online. It's at chcs.uncg.edu, and you'll see it down under the posts um, section. Any other questions? Dan Curry, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, thanks, Stephen. Um, great presentations. I think they've, all three of them, really kind of put a bow on the challenge we have here in Greensboro and the local community in producing affordable housing units. Um, you know, it's almost counterintuitive to think that one of the solutions is we need higher property values. But um, I think when you look at the low rate of property appreciation here in Greensboro. And I've had the opportunity to talk with a lot of uh, builders recently who are trying to put product on the ground. Um, and, you know, a, a two by four here is the same cost as a two, virtually the same cost as a two by four in Charlotte or any place else. Uh, and these crazy volatile uh, building material prices and even the availability of materials right now is is making it virtually impossible to build in in what we would what I would consider an affordable range, which is you know 150 or below, not 250 or below. But um, you know, if if you've got a, a a production cost of of 150 and it appraises at 130 or 135, um, you know, then you've got a problem, and that's the, that's the real situation that most of the builders are talking about right now is, is that gap is, is just growing. Um, and it's the combination of price, price to builds going up, but property values are not keeping track with that, particularly at the, at the lower range. So um, I don't know if anybody wants anybody on the call or the speakers want to talk about any potential solutions that can assist um, the builders, uh, you know, and, and well, the city's program is great for down payment assistance, but we're, we're still fighting that appraisal issue every yeah, day. I, I can speak. I mean, because we, we deal with, obviously we deal with that all the time. So this is not something that I would say Greensboro and North Carolina in general has really had to deal with until the last year to 18 months. But other states that see massive appreciation in homes. And I mean, I, I think in your, in your comment, you had said that saying that the solution was higher home prices. I, I, I mean, if, I don't think that, that's not a solution. That's just a fact of what we're experiencing. It's not, it's, I'm not, I was never saying that, you know, we need home prices to keep going up, but that's just a fact over time. I mean, you look at what our grandparents paid for their homes, you know, uh, and our parents paid for their homes, you know, in 1976 in New Jersey, you know, my parents bought their house for $40,000 you know, it was a 3,500 square foot split level home on a little over half acre of land in New Jersey. If they sold that today, it would be, you know, how many times over, you know, they probably sell that house for close to 400,000 easy. And that's, it wasn't, and that was in a very rural part of town. We're not even talking about high appreciation neighborhoods. So what you're seeing though, in this case of like, like you just said, you're seeing a cost to build, and what's the appraised value? And what an appraisal is, is a backwards look to justify the value. Now, the reality is, is that it's what we as lenders use to justify how much we're going to lend somebody. The true value of a home is what the buyer and seller agree to pay for it and sell it for. So in your example, a $150,000 house, that's, that's the value of the home once it closes. But how much am I going to lend on it in that case? Let's say we're doing a conventional loan at 5% down. We're going to take 130 and make our required down payment 5% of that number. Well, what happens to the rest of the money? Well, the buyer has to pay for it. And that's been very common in other states. I mean, California is the other example, um, the other extreme. You've got people that are planning on putting 
hundreds of thousand dollars down on a home on a price that's very high, it's not going to appraise and they don't care because they have the means to do it. We have never been faced with that. The, the mindset has always been, well, if the house doesn't appraise, we'll just renegotiate. And what's the seller going to do? They'll just come down. Well, that's the difference between a buyer and a seller's market. When we're in a seller's market, the seller says, I don't care if it appraised for not. Are you going to buy it or not? A good listing agent will usually ask the question in a multiple offer situation, if the house doesn't appraise, can your buyer make up the difference? And so we're talking about two different things. If we're talking about catering to the lower housing markets and how do we keep a home affordability, that is counterintuitive to somebody trying to sell their home. And I am, you know, I've, I've been over backwards for my first time home buyers, you know, people that need down payment assistance. Yes, they're more work, but you know, if that's the way that they need to get into a home, we are happy to do them and we do them often. But on the flip side of that, you can't fault a seller that has lived in a home and owned it for 10 years. And now they're trying to sell it to try and limit what they can make on their home. That is, that is part of our, you know, our society and capitalism. And, and I mean, quite honestly, and in real estate, it's how most people earn their wealth. We all, you know, we work jobs, we make money, we use that money to live, but multi-generational wealth that we typically see, and it does, and I don't mean that to mean someone passing on millions of dollars, but how people generally over time, how their homes have appreciated is how they gain, how they give their retirement a shot in the arm, how they make a lot of money in that. And it's between the difference between renting and buying, because every time you pay a mortgage, you're at least building up a sense of equity in your home because you're paying that down. That coupled with the appreciation that builds, you create this gap of, hey, now I just made this much money. I can take a portion of that, put it down to my next house, and I'm left with an extra 50 grand. And that, yeah, and that, and I, I couldn't, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, that's, that's why the inability to put affordable housing product on the market when we have so many people looking for that product is such an equity issue for the community because we're missing out. The whole segment of our community is missing out on that wealth building opportunity because they don't have product to buy. So I, anyway, I, I couldn't agree with you more on that. Yeah, I mean, and I agree with that too. And then, and and what we're seeing because of the market that we're in, because of that lack of inventory, you know, you know, those people that need that, you know, you know, when I bought my first house, we did a hundred percent loan, and I've been able through over time. You know, I don't, you know, the last couple of houses I bought, I didn't have to do a hundred percent loan, but I did in the beginning. And if I wasn't able to do that, I would not have, I would not have gained. The, the future down payments in that necessarily over time. And that's the hardest thing right now is when someone doesn't want to accept your offer because it has too many strings attached to it. Again, I, and I feel for each and every one of those people and we do everything we can to get their offers accepted. But at some point the seller, you know, for their own well being, they're going to accept the offer that they think either A makes them the most money, B, has the most certainty of closing. And, you know, it's, I've seen a lot too, where sellers sometimes maybe they had an offer and they, and maybe somebody tried to do a certain type of loan and they got burned because whether it was a repair issue because of FHA or somebody didn't get their down payment funds or because their debt to income went from 42.9 to 43.3% and they no longer qualified. You know, you've got little things like that where sometimes I've seen where sellers are like, I will not do, I will not accept this kind of loan because they got burned by it before. And that doesn't mean that it would ever happen again. It just might be circumstance, but you know, I mean, they're, I just see that as two kind of diametrically opposed things that I, I don't have a solution for that. There's a gap in the middle where the interests are different. So it's going to, it's hard to bridge that gap, but. So Scott, I want to, I'm sorry. I have a question that may need to be another whole program, but what about reverse mortgages and um, people who are older who don't have the finances to continue to live in the lifestyle that they have lived 
and they do um, a reverse mortgage. Is that something that requires a whole other program <laughs> or can anybody talk about this now? Steven, that's up to you if you want me to get into that. Yep. Can we do a thumbnail version of what a reverse mortgage is besides what Tom Selleck sells us on? Yeah. on... <laughs> yeah. So basically what you're doing there is a reverse mortgage is an FHA loan where they will require a down payment or you to have a certain amount of equity in your home, but yet you have no, you don't have payments on it. But what happens is, is every month your loan balance goes up because the interest accrues on the loan and you're still paying FHA mortgage insurance. And I say paying, it's just increasing the value. So for it, the program was really designed for somebody that, you know, you worked your butt off your whole life, you paid your house off, you have social security, maybe a small pension, but you have no, you have no money. Mm -hmm. So what happens is, is that now you're using that equity to help you live and you can get, you can either pay you monthly or you can get a sum of money and live off of that. And then again, you have no house payment. So, but the loan balance keeps going up. So typically what happens is, and that would, that would last for the most part up until you get, you know, to the end. And then when the home is passed on to heirs, that loan gets paid off just like any other. And, and there's a maximum amount of money that you can have a loan on your house for? Yes, typically it's in that roughly 70% range based on the value. Of the right. I mean, that don't 100% don't quote me on that. It varies and there's different circumstances that alters what that can and can't be. So, but that's a ballpark number. 70% of the, uh, of for what? The appraised, appraised value. value. Appraised value. Okay. Right. So if you had a hundred thousand dollar house, the most that they would give you is seventy. Okay. Okay. I think Sophia Crisp is next. Yeah, I just wanted to touch on what you said, um, Scott, uh, about generational wealth, because that's the conversation we're having with people um, when they're trying to get a home, whether they're in the class and they're ready to go, or they're in some of our other classes and trying to get on the path to home ownership. This is the way to create generational wealth. Mm -hmm. And for you, it's most people's only way because we all go to work and plan for retirement, but the house is very important. And um, it really makes them look at it in a holistic point of view. Yes, I want to get a house. Yes, I may pay less or more than I'm paying in rent, but at the end of the day, this is this is the legacy that I leave my family for generations on down. And it's a, it's a big deal. And a lot of folks have not been thinking about it like that, but that's what it should be. This is the road to generational wealth. You may get to experience some of it, but if not, your children and, and your grandchildren will. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, uh, and Stephen, you had a program about that in the past uh, with, uh, in particular, African-Americans. Who, Correct. Yes, that and that was so enlightening. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Crystal had some comments um, talking about uh, differences in appraisals. I, I recently saw a, an article uh, to this effect, a biracial family who put out pictures of uh, their African American uh, uh, relatives, uh, got one appraisal, took those down, put up pictures of their white relatives, got a different appraisal. Um, Crystal, did you want to follow up on that? Yes, yeah, Stephen, that's that's a great a segue and a support what I was suggesting. I've noticed, and I'm curious, Scott and or Melissa, I've noticed that, and I love the conversation generational wealth, but it seems that there's systemic racism in the systems that are we're trying to get into to build the wealth that uh, Sophia was talking about. You know, we can have everything right, you know, good credit, good zip code, whatever it takes, or whatever the the metrics are. But when you compare across racial lines, there are disparities in the rates of the loans that are being provided. And, 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 and of course, on the opposite side, the sellers are also treating those with different strings attached differently. That's a different conversation. But in terms of the systems of getting access to the capital, it's consistently difficult for us to build wealth um, in that because of those particular systemic barriers. I'm curious to know how you all have perhaps mitigated those barriers for uh, people across racial lines? Um, that's a great question. And I think Scott can certainly touch on anything. I, I saw what you described about the appraisal. And you know, to me, I think that's heartbreaking. And I also am a realist. So I'm, I agree that it, I'm sure it exists. Um, 
an interesting note is a lot of times when we go in a house to list it, the first thing a person will say is, well, I've put all our personal pictures up. And I always immediately say, I don't think you should. If it's your home, that seems like a, a that seems unnecessary. I think that um, I think that our I think our society needs to catch up to where we should be, honestly. And I tell people, put, leave your personal pictures up. I think that comes from years ago. And sadly, what you described, it's probably not years ago. It's probably now. But I do. I I constantly tell people, you know. If you know, we've got to quit living in the way people lived back in the 40s, 50s, 60s. And so it has to start with that kind of conversation. When someone says, I'm putting my pictures up, say, no, don't. But also meeting an appraiser and ma making sure that we do the best we can. But it's sad. And I don't know that I don't know how to change it other than each person has to be responsible for communicating in a way that is, is forward thinking and in, in the way the way that we all should be. And Scott, you can touch on anything you want with that. I mean, I think, I think it's just, it's just to me heartbreaking that we're even having this conversation. But, but I think it, it's valid. But it, it needs, it, we need to talk about it though, because I, agree. No, I, mean, I, I, I encourage you. That there's the need to talk about it. I, 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 lo I would love to talk about it and actually help with any solution because I, it just breaks my heart that it's existing still. So Scott, before you jump jump in, I encourage you all to um to look up the um the, the documentary that just came out um called Long Island Divided, and it speaks to racism and fair housing. It's a three year study that occurred in Long Island, New York, which is very personal to me because that's where I grew up, and mm -hmm. um it occurs with appraisals, it occurs with sales, it still occurs. It's very very subtle, but my takeaway from that is. Sometimes you're discriminating and you don't even know it. It's what you say and what you don't say. It could be about schools or something else. It was very, very disheartening to watch, but we do need to catch up, but we're not there yet by any means. I'll definitely watch that. I dropped um, links to those in the, in the chat, uh, both Thanks. to the New York Times uh, uh, article about the minority appraisals uh, differences, uh, differences and the uh, Long Island Divided. Crystal? Yeah, not to take up too much space for Stephen, but I wanted to tell Melissa I appreciate your comments. And I think what it's going to take to Sophia's point is just an intentional uh, checking of, okay, when I make decisions with lending, is this fair? And is this different from the past trends of people with the same demographics, zip codes, and things of that nature? And that is isn't tapping into implicit bias, bias. That is tapping into just the way you're used to doing things. And there are some people who, particularly that are white, that don't, aren't that qualified for the amount of loans they're getting. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, why is that? And that's where to start. <laughs> so, and I think the access and the privilege comes in to say, well, I'm not qualified, but I know I'm gonna get it. That is being perpetuated with those on the other side and not to call Scott out, but I'm saying if Scott, we can find a way if, you, if that's happening to at least open the opportunities for people, black and brown people as well. And that's all I'm saying. And I'm not, again, I, having met you, I sense you have great intentions. And I think you're doing phenomenal work, but I think across the system, not just you and your office or whatever, just in general, we're seeing that consistency of just not being, giving access to these, these opportunities. Thank you, Stephen. Yeah, if I can actually follow up on that one. Um, we've been doing since 2006, uh, a mortgage analysis. Um, the data comes to us from uh, uh, Housing Mortgage Disclosure Act. Uh, with each application that Scott gets, um, there's a loan application registry that's uh, completed, um, and it and it lists all of the demographic details, all of the economic details of the loan applicant, uh, male, female, black, white, Asian, etc. Um, it has the census tract in which they're purchasing. Uh, it has their uh, loan amount that they're applying for, the type of loan, et cetera. Uh, we've done what's called logistic regression analysis uh, on this uh, each time. It's, it's, it's a simply a, a prediction of whether or not someone gets the loan or doesn't get the loan. It's approved or has some other reason for not being approved. Um, controlling for race, ethnicity, sex, uh, uh, income, amount of property, same type of neighborhood, et cetera. And we see in Greensboro, um, and, and I've been running this each year since 2006, there's about a 26% 
difference in the odds of approval for an African-American male compared to a white male, all other things being equal. Now, the, the one caveat here is that the Humda data doesn't capture reason for denial for all cases. Um, there, there's a gap uh, of, for those where it does capture that information. We see that credit score uh, and uh, debt are the two main factors. Um, so the difference between the African-American community and the white community in purchasing those homes, same home, same income, all everything else being equal, is that credit score. And I think that's where Sophia's program comes in really importantly is repairing credit, um, working on uh, uh, presenting as a better home buyer before getting to that application uh, stage. That's something that you see within white families, I think. Uh, hey, let me help you out. Um, here's what we need to do before we get to that loan uh, period. Because you've had three, four, five generations of home ownership, even in working class families, whereas we haven't had that same within African-American families, that, that, that may be one of those differences. Mm -hmm. So buyer education programs, credit rebuilding programs. We, we proposed back in 2007 for City of Greensboro, we need to target specific communities for credit building programs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would say that in general, um, across the board, fiscal literacy is horrible with young people. Mm -hmm. And I, from what I have ex experienced and what I've been told it is even more so to just the, the lack of discussions um, in, in, in black families. Um, there, there's a realtor that I, I do a lot of work with and, you know, and, you know, I think a, a lot of us in everything that we do, you know, rolling back to, um, you know, with everything that went on downtown, um, across the nation, um, all, everyone should have, if they didn't take a step back and look at what are they doing to be part of the problem with race relations and what are they doing to be part of the solution? And from my part, you know, I've tried to have, you know, genuine, honest conversations um, so that I can do my part to, to be a part of the positive change that we all need. And I'm, I, you know, all I can say is, you know, I mean, I appreciate Crystal not trying to call me out, but, you know, all the, the folks that get higher rates and higher closing costs are those with bad credit. And what I find is generally speaking, that has to do more with, at least, and, and again, and this is with who, who I particularly work with, it's what I, you know, so it's what I can speak to. It has much more to do with how they were brought up and what type of money they have as to how that translates to those items, as opposed to whether, how, what, how, how are we even able to structure a loan based on that information? And so from my perspective, you know, we give, you know, we give the same, we give credit counseling to everybody who walks in the door, whether you've got a 780 credit score or a 580 credit score. Um, and so where that comes into play is I, it does not, it does not shock me one bit that this exists across you know, and Scott, Scott's very good at it, working with people. Sometimes it takes for us six months to a year to get it to a point where you can do it. But I will say one thing I learned doing, I met, I went and observed the public schools and there in the school I went to, there was a class that the people took that was literally just for kids in the, I think they were in the 10th grade about how to establish good credit, how to do business all that and i think that that's where we all need to pull together and figure out how to educate even at a younger age how important it is and and i don't know how to do that in the schools or wherever but i think it's important to do it because i saw them doing it there and i thought people really understood it and it was and i i don't think when i got out of college i mean my credit wasn't good at all so i mean i i think learning that in a in a low in a school would be, would have helped me as well so yeah, uh, I just want to add, uh, following uh, Stephen's comments, so I, I actually work with the Honda data a lot. So 
before 2018, the Hamda data actually doesn't really have the credit scores and, uh, and that information. So if you just look at that, uh, not controlling for credit quality, there is really a huge uh, disparity between uh, uh, minorities and uh, white applicants in terms of their approval rates. Um, but even uh, so, uh, there is a very recent uh, paper um, looking at the, the 2018 data where there is a, a whole uh, lot of uh, the credit quality information, credit score and other data income ratio, all those kind of things. Uh, so the racial disparity actually uh, shrinks if you control for those credit quality, but there is still pretty sizable uh, difference between uh, minorities and uh, white men, white uh, applicants in terms of their approval rates. So I think um, there might be something else going on uh, in addition to just write bad, bad credit quality or, or things like that. So okay. I, yeah, so I, I actually have several papers trying to look at uh, uh, from the lender side, how uh, they are uh, addressing these kind of problems. Just want to add to that. Thanks. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to call time on us here. Um, we've had a really great discussion. Um, we've gotten into some some great rabbit holes, um, uh, very technical as well as uh, uh, social impact. I uh, have been very appreciative of our, our guest speakers, Dr. Chu, Mr. Schubert, and Ms. Greer. Um, really appreciate you guys uh, uh, lending your, your talents and expertise uh, to talk about um, this uh, housing market. Um, next month, uh, as I mentioned, we will have the City of Greensboro Neighborhood Planning uh, talking about the 10-year affordable housing plan and some of the new programs uh, that are proposed in that plan. It has been uh, accepted and uh, ratified by the um, City Council, uh, and so we'll be going into effect um, uh, shortly. Uh, please join us again, go.uncg.edu forward slash housing hangout to sign up for next month. I'll have uh, that link live uh, probably next week um, and start uh, uh, sending those uh, announcements out um, shortly. We appreciate uh, everybody joining us and, and see you next month. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>